Coming up on this edition of the EV Revolution Show, my review of the 2023 Kia Sportage plug-in hybrid. Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks for tuning in to my review of this 2023 Kia Sportage plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or PHEV. This is the EX Premium model here in Canada. Thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to watch the show. I hope things are going well. And yes, it's another plug-in hybrid that I decided to look at because there are more of them coming out that actually have some decent capable battery and old electric capability. So that's what I want to focus on with my reviews. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show view on this brand new 2023 Sportage. Now the Sportage family with Kia has been around since the 90s, been around a long time. This is the first plug-in hybrid, a plug-in version of that. They've had a hybrid for a few years, but this is the first time it's a plug-in in the 2023 model year. Um, this is the fifth generation Sportage, and as you can see by the B-roll and the design footage, it's a polarizing design. This is a new design direction for Kia in mapping in with the EV6 and some of their other models that are taking that more angular, that more futuristic approach to design language and to functionality. I think it looks nice. It certainly is not unpleasing. I think it looks good. Um, and, you know, they've done a good, a good thing here in the design. Um, you know, this is a peppy vehicle. It's great for around town driving. It's got decent old electric range and it's got a roomy cabin. And those are kind of the highlights of this vehicle going into this review. So let me touch upon it a little bit more um, uh, in, you know, kind of my thoughts around it. Now, if we stay with the design element, you can see it's got this futuristic front grille. Um, obviously, the grille is mainly plastic, but in this case, because it's a plug-in hybrid, there's a lot of openings because it does have an internal combustion engine, and it has a battery to help offset that, and they work together in a lot of cases. So you will have basically an internal combustion vehicle that's been electrified with a smaller power trying to give it that plug-in EV capabilities. But you know they've gone with this new design lights and the design language in keeping with their current model trend. You know I think it looks good overall. It's not a, not a as I mentioned, it's not an unpleasant looking vehicle. I just think it doesn't really stand out in a sea of compact SUVs that, we're, that we see out there. You know multiple lines from every single OEM as far as small, medium and large SUVs. There's lots of them out there. So this will blend right in with anything else that you see on the road, which a lot of people like. Now, if we look at the rear of it, what I get reminded is the EV6. There seems to be a lot of DNA and styling language from Kia's EV6, which a lot of people like. Kind of that higher raked rear end with the lights protruding from that and a bit of a bar across that. So I think it looks good. Again, it's got a nice opening hatch and I'll talk about cargo room and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, wrapping up design language, you make your own um, assumptions and your own thoughts about if you like the looks of this or not. I think, again, it's a pleasing SUV. It's going to fit in right into the marketplace. It's already based on a uh, on a vehicle offering that Kia has had for quite a long time, for 30 years or more. So, it, you know, it's out there. A lot of people know the Sportage name and it should do well. One more time. All right, let's pop the hood and see what's under here. As I mentioned, this is an internal combustion version uh, of the Sportage. I need the prop bar here doesn't have struts so I need to prop it up so it has a 1.6 liter four-cylinder turbo engine that powers the vehicle when it's not running in an electric mode it also will provide heat uh, and of course run the coolant and all that kind of stuff through the system so it's primarily driven by the engine but again in this plug-in hybrid version it does also have a battery pack so the battery pack for this vehicle is under the floor uh, in different areas here so it's, it's not a huge battery pack, but at least it's something. It's a 13.8 kilowatt hour battery pack, lithium ion, uh, which produces an EPA rated all electric range of up to 55 kilometers. Now in my traveling and using this for the last few days, I've been consistently seeing around 50, but I'll explain when I'm in my driving thoughts about 
why it's a little hard to actually see that 50, but I'll have to trust the computer. So let me get back to you on that. So it's got a decent enough battery to do, in theory, a lot of at least most of the daily use trips that are out there if the average is 30 miles or so, 50 kilometers or so, let's say, it's just on the border of that. Um, I do a 50 kilometer trip back and forth and I could tell you that the motor has run lots of times during that trip, but I was able to use up all the EV power that I originally charged, started the charge with. So uh, again, it's a little bit complicated in how this system works, but I'll talk about that later on. Up front, it is an all-wheel drive system, so but the single electric motor drive is up front. Uh, the gasoline, of course, powers uh, both the wheels um, where, where it's needed to as well. But in, in all-electric mode, you'll get uh, almost 90 horsepower and 225 pound-feet of torque from that electric motor, when the engine, uh, the engine by itself will give you 177 horsepower and 195 pound-feet of torque. And when they're combined, you get about 261 horsepower and about 258 pound-feet of torque and that's if you mash the accelerator to kick in the engine even if you're on EV only mode to get the maximum torque and, and benefits out of both. Now charging for this vehicle is through a charge port. It's got a gas cap on the driver's side and the charging ports on the passenger side. Push this open. There's nothing really much fancy to see. You've got your standard J1772 port. That's it. This vehicle just supports level one and level two charging. It does not support DC fast charging or level three, so you won't see a CCS plug here. Just your standard J1772. It uh, is a 7.2 kilowatt charger, so it's a decent charger which means in the, if you just use your 110, 120 volt outlet, you'll get a full charge. You'll get that 13 or so kilowatt hours of battery uh, storage juiced back up in about 11 and a half to 12 hours. Um, and if you are using a level two charger, then that will cut down to just about two hours. So easy enough, let's say if you have workplace charging or you're at a mall, you're at a library, rec center, something like that, um, you'll be able to plug this in in just two hours get back that 50 kilometers or so of range. All right, now that you've seen the outside, let's start looking at the inside. We'll start with the cargo area first as I can figure out where the button is for this. Here we go. It's got to push it the right way. There's a key fob as well. You can open it. You can open this from a button inside the dash as well. Got a nice high lift over and it has a smart sensor on it. So if you're in the garage, I parked this in my garage at home, it know, it'll sense where the garage door is and it won't bonk it because it actually goes pretty high. Uh, so that, I thought that was a cool feature for a car in this type of class. But it's a pretty nice opening, nice and wide opening. You can slide a lot of stuff in here, do Costco runs, Ikea, whatever, that kind of stuff. Um, the cargo area behind the first seat, sorry, behind the second row, is 977 liters and if you put the second row down you will get um, 1855 liters of cargo space which is a pretty good amount of space so let's have a look at the inside of the vehicles you know standard fare here nothing's really going to blow you away but this is the ex premium it is well equipped with a leather ish material uh driver's seat has uh, multi-power fun uh, power functions excuse me let me get in here all right, so a nice clean dash, as you can see. Uh, everything standard Kia, the new logo. Um, everything is uh, up to date with the rest of the Kia product line here. So there's nothing really uh, too crazy on here. It's got the standard features that you'll see on the Kia Nero and on the Soul and on the Sportage, sorry, the um, Sorento and some of the other mo Kia models. They've standardized on all these kind of controls and buttons. So it's got everything you need, a couple of memory seat uh, positions for the driver, all that kind of stuff. Now, the infotainment system is a 12.3 setup. Um, and then you have your driver's binnacle, which is at a 4.2 TFT cluster here, which gives you different selectable information that you can go through. I'm not gonna go through a lot of this, but it's pretty well standard fare that you'll see on a lot of uh, vehicles nowadays, which is nice. I will talk about lane keeping and um, the driver assist when I do the driving uh, review in a few minutes. Uh, as far as the main navigation, you have this kind of home screen that it defaults to, different color patterns, and then just your standard stuff, not a whole lot. Um, I've been checking out the, the PHEV mode a lot where I can see how things are happening and you'll see that in my driving video so I won't spend time a lot, lot uh, on it here um, but you know different things that's going on N again everything's functional everything works it's a nicely appointed uh, nicely laid out interior you've got all your buttons up here you've got a really nice moonroof uh, situation going on here sunroof going on good room for the passengers again this, this they call this a compact suv but i would say it's a compact almost to mid-size because it's got a good amount of room 
uh, for doing things and a nice thinner console with a good size storage area here and everything seems to work very nice one thing that was nice on this ES package it's got heated seats and cooling seats as well not doing them too much heated steering wheel um, so different auto hold as well then you can change your different driving modes down here with parking parking is just a rear camera but there is an option uh, I've got the hood open the trunk open uh, so the hatch open so that's why it's pointing to the sky but otherwise it would show you uh, the rear and it's got the beeping and uh, the line lines as well on that um, but if you upgrade to the uh, to another option of this uh, you can get a 360 camera view which will blend it all together to get you that surround sound and a couple of usb ports here a 12 volt port up front i've got your uh, iphone and uh, samsung phone uh, charging mat here which works well uh, then again the hvac system so this is a, kind of a mix of touch screen and knobs the knobs are for volume and power but you do have an hvac system where you can change things all here um, which works really well. I kind of wish that this part was maybe some buttons. Um, one thing I noticed is you saw here, it always defaults back to this mode. Sometimes I might want to leave it on climate control for a while, especially if you're going through snow or rain or whatever, you want to make adjustments to it. Like if I want to change the heat, I got to go back to that mode and change it here um, as I drive. So it's a little bit annoying that you have to actually press you know a button then to do this stuff versus just having it like this uh either leaving it to your last setting i kind of wish it would it would stay there that's probably the only thing that i found a little annoying in this vehicle overall um but you know it's got a nice your adaptive cruise control here and your lane keeping and i'll again talk about that in the driving but uh, a nice comfortable interior Okay, just quickly look at the rear seat again nothing too crazy going on here really kind of small rear storage pocket so not much so that you could put in here but it does have your cup holders in the middle in the fold down armrest so that's good to put cups and water bottles and stuff the map pockets a little coat hook for bags or something uh has chargers that are built into the seat if you can see that here so that's kind of convenient for rear passengers if they want to charge but otherwise, just a very comfortable layout. Very nice for four people, five in a pinch. And as I always say, it's got that big uh, roof uh, shade that I can slide back even more to give it a nice open airy cabin. All right, just get in and out and see how this thing uh, fits as I do all the time. Yeah, really easy to get in. Lots of leg room, as you can see, fist full. These seats do recline about 20 degrees or so. So I have it kind of set up a little high, but yeah, really nice. Nice and easy. All right, now that we've seen the outside and the inside, let me take you for a quick drive and give some of my thoughts. All right, give us some quick driving thoughts of the 2023 Kia Sportage PHEV here. Um, all in all, as I said, it's, it's a, it, it is a really nice car. And you know, the Sportage has been around for quite some time, so it should be nice. It should um, be comfortable and it's relatively quiet. Again, it's not as quiet as an all EV because you do hear the motor when it kicks in. Uh, you hear the wheel, you know, you can hear the wheels right now. Right now it's an EV mode, so it's, the engine's not running at all. So it's relatively quiet compared to other internal combustion vehicles. Um, overall, the driving impressions are nice. I'm going to throw the lane keeping and the cruise, adaptive cruise control coming up here as well into the segment. But overall, I just wanted to give you a quick summary that um, it's a nice, pleasant vehicle to drive. Now, where I've been having problems is just trying to really see how much range I can get on electric only because it gives you this starting number of about 50. I've been 50, 52 is what I've been seeing every time I charge it up fully, uh, which is pretty good, but um, it's hard to tell because the engine comes on and off, uh, especially when it's cold. Like right now the engine's running and I've got it set to EV mode only, but because it's cold outside, it's um, zero degrees Celsius, minus one and zero, um, the engine's going to come on to warm up. It's going to come on just to quickly warm up the cabin and then shut off. Right now, the engine shut off again. So it's one of those where it will maximize the juice that you have in the battery to a degree, but it will continue to still condition the cabin and condition the, the heating of the engine and the, the running of the engine part as well. Just to show you the so energy flow here in the plug-in hybrid version of the Kia Sportage or Sportage, um, as you can see, the motor at this point, while I'm in EV-only mode, um, provides power to the battery where the drivetrain then uh, the wheels are powered by the battery drivetrain here so as I run the juice down um, it switches back and forth uh, with basically driving the vehicle on the battery only uh, and then the as you can see the rpms here the engine is just basically acting as a generator uh, at uh, you know 1300 rpm just providing juice to the battery 
um, and then if I need, once the battery depletes, the engine will kick on and it should um, convert the driving, the drivetrain of power to the drivetrain from the engine to wheels as it depletes of the battery range. But I just wanted to show you that the power flow on this hybrid is typical where it's automatic. Uh, you can obviously select which mode you want to be in. I've selected EV mode and once EV mode runs out, the battery depletes. Uh, probably to about 1%, then it will um, uh, it will kick into the engine. Um, now, if I give it some gas here, let me just press on the accelerator. Yeah, if I punch the accelerator, then of course the engine kicks in, as you can see here, um, and you can hear it. And uh, then the engine starts going back to, uh, to an idle mode um, and off in this case, where I'm still, still have some battery juice, so I can still drive on battery only. Again, see zero RPMs. 100% being driven by the battery um, at this point. Now there is no regenerative braking um, as far as setting anything on here. The plus or minus actually change gears. They don't do anything to do with regenerative braking, these paddles on the steering wheel. Um, the only braking you get is when you coast a little bit and when you hit the brake pedal, then you'll get some of that braking back. If I hit the brake pedal now, you'll see that there's a reverse flow back to the battery. Then I give it the accelerator and I'm starting to use fuel and the engine again kicks in. So it's an automated system. I'll get a good clearer view as I drive more about what the ranges are. But I just thought I'd show that to you. That uh, again, making it easy for people that don't want to make the leap to full all electric. Um, making it easy for them to get adjusted to electric only in the plug-in hybrid. All right, just quickly show you the lane keeping and the adaptive cruise control here on the uh, Kia Sportage plug-in hybrid. Um, so I'm on the highway, as you can see, uh, fairly open conditions. Um, and I've got the lane keeping activated. You see the green steering wheel there on the bottom uh, left. That means that it's activated in the lane keeping mode and the adaptive cruise is activated. If you look at the top of the display, you'll see uh, the speed with the distance there and that it's activated, basically. There's a little uh, ding, a little noise that it makes when I activate it. So I've been driving now for about a minute. I haven't touched the wheel at all. Um, so as you can see, it's keeping the lane uh, very well. It's, it uses very minute movements without ping-ponging, but just kind of really subtle movements to stay in the lane. Even negotiated a, a bit of a curve in the highway there. And then uh, when the right lane um, back, uh, it was two lanes, became three, the one right lane was an exit lane and it managed to stay in the center lane without veering off as sometimes some of the systems aren't sure which way you want to go um, when there's an exit lane there. So um, it actually held that pretty good. So again, I've been driving now for uh, about a minute and a half, almost two minutes, and now it's giving me the warning, put the hands on the wheels. So just a little nudge, the warning goes away. There was no audible yet. I think if I let it count down, I let it go for a while, there'll probably be an audible warning and a more visual warning. But you can drive like this for a good, you know, probably two minutes anyway. I guess it's uh, determined on speeds and things like that, but it's, uh, it's a very smooth system, uh, be it uh, basic, you know, as far as staying within the lane you're in, and maintaining the speed and of course the distances from the vehicle in front of you based on the distance you set in the adaptive cruise control, which I've got at four, which I think is the highest right now. So maintaining a good distance, but it's slowing down, matching traffic speeds here. I've set it for 105 kilometers and I'm doing 94 because uh, it's going with traffic, maintaining that spacing element in front of me very nicely. It will break. It will stop as well uh, to the car in front of you. And then when the car in front of you moves, you have to either press the start button again for the adaptive cruise, which is this one, like a, you know, keep going again, um, or hit the accelerator pedal and it will reactivate. And a lot of, a lot of models are like that as well. So all in all, it's a good system. Again, it's designed to take a little bit of the stress uh, out of long distance driving so that you can relax a little bit, let the car maintain the lane and the speed. Again, I haven't, I haven't touched this wheel since I've had the nudge it there. So it's been, you know, at least a good minute, a minute and a half, maybe two minutes now. So um, it's a nice smooth system. Uh, I have to commend, uh, of course, it's very similar to a lot of the other Kia, Hyundai and Genesis products, of course, uh, utilizing a lot of the same technologies um, in this. So good on uh, Kia for at least a good system and I'll have uh, finish up my wrap up on the uh, driving.
I think for the average consumer, my takeaway in this, it's a nice, comfortable car, nice seating positions. You sit up high, good visibility, good maneuverability, all that kind of stuff as a compact SUV, small SUV is going to be. You're going to give you roominess yet uh, compact enough to, to be useful in moving around. Um, as a plug-in hybrid, I always want to see more battery range, so this isn't bad. The system automates the process, so a user doesn't have to think about it. They just charge it in every night and let the vehicle maximize uh, the battery uh, in the way that it does. Um, I'll come up at the, at the end of the um, show where I talk about some of the financial stuff coming up and give you some of my thoughts on whether or not it's significant enough. I think it is, uh, but I'll let you make those decisions. But all in all, Kia has made, you know, it basically an already well-established, you know, uh, many, many decades that they've had this Portage out there brand vehicle, and that this is the first time that they've added a plug to it. So I think they've done a very good job. So just in summary, I think this is a very capable um, vehicle, as you saw. I would like the battery to be bigger, always in plug-in hybrids. If people don't want the choice to go all electric, I'd like them to have an option that has a battery that's bigger than 13 kilowatts, kilowatt hours, which this is, but this isn't bad. I was able to drive in my few days, 60% of my driving was all electric, 40% was in gas. Now it's really hard to kind of determine that, as I mentioned, because it doesn't, you know, the engine comes on and off on its own. It's even an EV only. It'll try to maximize the battery, but because it's cold out, the engine has to warm up and produce cabin heat and all that kind of stuff. So um, it tends to come on and off, but it does predict an EV range. And I think I'll go with that, a 50 kilometers of which I saw. So based on those numbers, um, you would say probably about a thousand bucks a year in fuel, driving about 20,000 kilometers a year at a buck 45 a liter. That's kind of what I based some math on. Uh, if you buy the Canadian version, you get the $5,000 off of this federally, and then you can also stack that with provincial incentives, and that could really bring that difference of about $7,000 in Canada here between the hybrid and the plug-in hybrid down substantially. So it's, it's worth uh, looking at, sorry, $8,500 is the difference there. So it's worth looking at. You could make up that difference then with the incentives in gas savings in about two to three years. So this isn't a prime example of the best plug-in hybrid that's out there. If you absolutely don't want an all-electric, I do encourage you to buy something that has a plug at least, so at least you can get some benefits, but the battery does need to be big enough to make financial sense and to make environmental sense. And this is kind of borderline. So do I recommend this product? Absolutely, I recommend it. However, I'd like you to consider, you know, do the math, run some numbers and see what your driving habits are going to be like. Um, but regardless, get something with a plug if you're going to get something. If you can get something with a bigger battery, great. Kia's done a great job of incorporating this. They don't want you to think about it. You can plug it in. In a 110, you don't have to get any equipment. Just plug it into your garage socket or, or your, a, a plug outside and let it charge overnight and get 50 kilometers or so of range, 55, whatever that is, uh, back. And, and that will help save some gas and save some emissions into the environment. After all, that's what I'm that's why I do what I do, right? Is to help do what we can uh, to combat climate change. So absolutely recommend this vehicle. I want to thank Kia Canada for allowing me the use of it. And I would certainly encourage you to check it out. And on that note, this is the closing part. So that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thank you very much for watching. If you have not subscribed on YouTube, please do. It would mean a lot. Tell your friends about my show as well. Click the bell if you want to get notified. Uh, I always want to humbly thank my Patreon supporters. You guys and gals know who you are. Your, your names are on the end of every show that I do in the credits, so I never want to forget you folks. If you're interested in, in learning more about Patreon, check out the link below. Continue to watch the EV landscape. As I said on my last show, 2023, year of the EV, I agree as well. Lots of things going to be happening, so check that out. And until the next show, everybody stay safe, take it easy, watch what's going on, and I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.